Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Conversations with Tyler. Today I'm chatting with Stuart Brand, and Stuart is an individual who is, above all else, an individual and who defies summary. But think of him as someone who was there early or there first in a multitude of movements, including cyber culture, psychedelics, the importance of Native Americans and their philosophy, the Whole Earth Catalog, the entire San Francisco scene, the Long Now Foundation, and the notion of the importance of durability and the idea of maintenance, the idea of bringing back woolly mammoths to life, and much, much more. Stuart Brand, welcome. Oh, well, thanks. It's a delight and an honor to be here. Thinking back on your entire life, in which ways do you see yourself as a product of the Cold War? I was in a town that was in Rockford, Illinois, that was rated as number seven on the list of the uh, American cities to be destroyed by the Soviet Union with bombs uh, because we built machine tools. And they uh, thought that was upstream of American industry and therefore blah, blah, blah. Uh, I was younger than 10 uh, by then. And uh, so I had nightmares about wandering around in a destroyed Rockford uh, where I was the only person left alive. So I had a uh, certain built-in apprehension. And among things that led to, as you may remember, I think you're old enough to remember when the mushroom cloud of the atomic explosion was the sort of symbol of human civilization at that point. Sure. That was uh, the way global everything thought about itself as the threat of, of nuclear annihilation. And uh, the photograph of the Earth from space that came along 68 and 69, 70 uh, from the Apollo program completely replaced that nuclear cloud with an image of a very hopeful looking Earth. And um, it's interesting because I realize now the Earth is sort of being deployed, that photograph which was so hopeful and green and, and uh, better than the mushroom cloud is now uh, evoked a lot in, in the context of climate change. And once again, it's sort of a, an image of a threat rather than a promise. So am I correct in thinking of you of somehow taking the research environment of World War II, the notion of threat, but redeveloping the ideas of the computer and the network forum to put forward some more optimistic, also more decentralized vision of the future. Yeah, I think there's some motivations for all of that. And I paid very close attention as I started to pay attention to things to the research library in electronics uh, that was going on at MIT. And they were studying um, you know, Shannon's version of information. They were studying uh, how communications, electronic communications, and then digital communications were transforming humanity, basically. And so that was a set of premises. Uh, this was before we had Moore's Law, but I had a sense of a self-enhancing process that was going to not just change everything once, but change it many times. That's what exponentials do, they keep going. And um, so I, I sort of rode that wave of an engineering understanding of civilization that uh, I have to this day. And how is it that you became such a decentralist? Oh, God, decentralist, that's interesting, you're right. Um, well, I'm, I mainly, I think you probably see this with the artists that you study. Um, I got a degree in biology from Stanford and then was going off to be an army officer. But in the course of that, I started hanging out with artists and bohemians in North Beach in San Francisco. This is the late 50s, early 60s. And so my first calling was as a professional photographer that then turned into a uh, so-called creative photographer doing art, and I was doing multimedia with a group called USCO in New York, and basically took on the role as, as an artist in the world, and that kind of stuck. And so my media would change a lot. I would start 
nonprofits and sometimes businesses and various things, but it was always this um, not part of a hierarchical organization and not trying to build a hierarchical organization. It was uh, basically enhancing creativity at the individual level. And so with the whole Earth catalog, that led to a kind of a lazy libertarianism that I later got over when I worked for Governor Brown of the state of California. But it was, um, and remember also as a biologist, and uh, evolution, Darwinian evolution is the most decentralized thing that you can imagine. It's way beyond the market economy is something that runs itself and is self-organizing at every level and at every scale. And so um, I haven't answered that question before, so answering it this time, I think I've talked myself into being a Darwinian. What was the influence of Nikos Kazantzakis on your thought? The Greek author, Zorba the Greek, right? Yeah, Zorba the Greek and Odysseus, the modern sequel and so on, which I think I'm the only person who read. Um, there was a strong, uh, committed romanticism there. Uh, it was also clear in Ayn Rand, who I also paid attention to for a while before the preposterousness of it all took it over. But um, Kazantzaki had this, you know, sort of commit everything to um, to your theory of the world even if it's wrong. And um, I got over that also because uh, that's, that way lies madness and also great destruction. But it was fun to go down that road with him. He's a beautiful writer and thinker. In which ways is your thought drawing from America's pre-industrial past? Well, I'm old enough to have actually lived uh, with uh, ice boxes. Ice is what kept the uh, refrigerators cold in Michigan in our summers, and we used outhouses. So to a certain extent, I'm just, you know, grounded in Midwestern um, forest living. But also I, for some reason, picked up a strong, through a writer named Kenneth Roberts, a strong identification with New England and kind of traditional New England. Buckminster Fuller later played right into that for me. And so all of that has a kind of grounded continuity. Uh, I was, uh, you know, one of the three guns Midwesterners where I started with a BB gun and then got a pellet rifle and then a 22 and then a more serious rifle. Um, so hunting and fishing were part of the world I was in. Um, I didn't do much of either one, but that was who we were. You wanted to be a, a good outdoorsman. Alfred Hitchcock's Rear Window, how did it matter for you? Oh, God. Well, you know, because of the name James Stewart, because he was kind of lanky and laconic, um, I identified with him. My older brother, Mike, I figured was Burt Lancaster, but I was James Stewart. And so uh, two movies that Stewart made were Rear Window, where he was... Uh, with Grace Kelly, and he was a uh, uh, photojournalist, uh, and that looked exciting, and I later became a photojournalist. Uh, and then also he was in a, a movie called Broken Arrow, which was the first movie that was liberal about American Indians. It was really, really well-written, uh, well-researched on, on uh, Chiricahua Apache culture. And uh, James Stewart there is the guy who connects with Indians. And when I later married an Indian woman, Lois Jennings, uh, we used to uh, play scenes from that where she's watching him shaving and wondering what the hell he's doing because Indians don't shave. And uh, we, we just played that stuff out. So James Stewart was a, a handy character to identify with for me. And what do you think is the major intellectual influence from Native American or Indian perspectives? on your thought. Is it the idea of maintenance, something else? Well, part of it is that, I mean, it's surprised for me. 
I've been surprised a couple of times. I was surprised in Venice that it was basically an Asiatic uh, town. I was surprised by the Indians I was photographing in Oregon in 1963, I guess it was, um, that there was such a rich and active culture. This was not uh, people in the past with feathers and teepees. This was people in the present. Um, they were doing a wild horse roundup. They were cowboys, <laughs> not, uh, you know, cowboys and Indians uh, together. And uh, rather different cowboys than the ones I'd seen. The white cowboys tended to be very uh, ferociously individualistic and competitive. And the Indian cowboys I saw were much, much more collaborative. Um, and there was a, a gentleness, a constant humor, um, a welcome to people like me. So when I started hanging out, I was inspired by that experience to visit a lot of reservations and uh, just hang out with Indians. And I eventually did a multimedia show called America Needs Indians. And um, that turned out to be become a point of reference for the hippie subculture. And it was basically one subculture paying attention to another subculture for inspiration and um, and a sense of identity. And so the, the long hair convergence, as it was called, was um, a, a way for the, the older Indians, the, the, the long haired gentlemen, uh, and the younger Indians who were trying to decide who to be, because they had a lot of choices, uh, realizing that the continuity of their native culture was a really valuable thing, not something to feel bad about or to flee from. And that's played out very well. So uh, Indians are in way better shape now than they were when I first started paying attention. Or when Marlon Brando uh, did, before I got to know Marlon, um, he was basically at every place that I went to before I was, hanging out with uh, the Fish Indians in Washington, uh, with the um, sort of revolutionary Indians in Oklahoma, and uh, it, it was regarded with affection and respect by the Indians that I met. Now, if I try to place you in the earlier part of your career, and if I compare you to Buckminster Fuller, Norbert Wiener, Gregory Bateson, what, what are the key variables where you disagree with them? How, how should I sum up intellectually that difference? Um, <clears throat> I bought Norbert Wiener, I guess, first. And uh, he held up very well. Uh, Buckminster Fuller, the artists I was hanging out with were paying close attention to him and to Marshall McLuhan. And, um, and that, he was this amazing uh, thinker who sort of re revolutionized, revolutionized his whole behavior and his whole thought patterns around what he thought was a more... Um, productive way to behave and think in the world. The only person I know who's that radical with himself is Kevin Kelly, who uh, occasionally takes a notion and just goes all the way down just to see what's there. Uh, so Bucky only really changed himself once, but it was uh, an impressive change. Um, when I came across Gregory Bateson, he was sort of the corrective for... Um, for Buckminster Fuller for me because Fuller was so totally an engineer, uh, what, what Bateson would call a kind of an input-output approach to understanding and solving everything. Whereas uh, Bateson was much more, he, he was aware that every system is basically self-referential to some degree, which um, that's the kind of thing Fuller would never take on and hierarchically organized at a very deep conceptual level and, uh, and that we are always immersed in the system that we think we're isolating something from. And so uh, Gregory was wonderfully dubious about uh, engineering solutions, about uh, naive intention. Um, and went a little far in the mystical direction for me 
And so there were later corrections for that for me, because I'd kind of gone a mystical route back when I studied comparative religion at Stanford. And uh, that turned out to be eventually non-productive. And I think counterproductive, often people go down a mystical or romantic route. But that was all stuff that I was kind of working through. And uh, I got to know Fuller, I got to know Gregory Bateson very well. I never met Wiener. Um, but I hung out later with people like Marvin Minsky and other part of the MIT intelligentsia who are really still my frame of reference. So in 1968, the Whole Earth Catalog, you have the view that what the world needs is a, a photo of, of the Earth appearing to be one thing. What is the photo we need today? Well, what's <clears throat> interesting is the, the various photos of Earth, and, and one of the things I learned early on is people fixed on basically two photographs, the Earth rise photograph of the moon in the foreground, uh, which was powerful because you saw uh, in one frame and in one frame of reference a dead planet and a living planet. And boy, the difference is striking, and you're glad that you're on the living planet. It, it sort of incites you to want to make sure that it stays living. Um, and then there's the so-called blue marble, where the uh, photograph is taken with the sun uh, behind the spaceship, behind the camera. And so you see uh, uh, there's no crescent, there's no gibbous Earth. It's just a big round Earth, like people expect, which, of course, is the rarest photograph you can take. You have to be right in line with the sun to get that image. And But there were thousands of other photographs of Earth. Uh, Soviets took some. We took countless ones, and eventually I found their drawer at uh, NASA headquarters in Washington, where they all are. I just paged through her and you know picked out these amazing images and started using them in later Whole Earth catalogs. Um, I, I think one of the best things that's happened in this last century is, is that outside the planet perspective, and uh, every astronaut comes back with stories of how amazing it was, even though they're trained for and prepared for uh, being amazed. They are then really amazed by getting out there. And the photograph is just a glimpse of how powerful it is to be off planet and see the planet as a whole. So that, I think, will continue as we explore the rest of the solar system, uh, mostly with robots, sometimes with humans. Um, lately, I'm, I don't think we're going to the stars, Tyler. Uh, no. I think it's too far. What do you think? I don't think we are either. I think it's impossible. Uh, because of the distance. Because the, And the wear and tear on bodies, even if you freeze them. And uh, it's, you know, physical space is not what is scarce. So why not Nevada, I like to say. Okay, right. <laughs> How about space colonies? Where are you on those? Right outside the Earth, I think there will be some. But I've not for a long time been very optimistic about space as the future of progress. I just don't see what's the scarce input out there that we really need. So if you think, well, the earth is so crowded, we, we must go elsewhere. But if you've lived in New Jersey or the Netherlands or you know South Korea, that hardly seems like an imperative. Exactly. Um, I think I share that. I think it'll be basically voluntary and, um, and of interest. Uh, it's, you know, science fiction can makes great use of the generation ships and so on, but uh, Kim Stanley Robinson recently did a book called, I think, Aurora, where basically makes your point and my point that uh, even if you get people out that far, the wear and tear on the social fabric, on the biology, on everything, um, you, you cannot isolate uh, a very complex biological system like humans uh, for that long and, and expect to get anywhere that's useful. So, what, what was the nature of your mother's interest in space and space colonies? She seemed almost obsessed with it. Yeah, she was a Vassar girl who uh, was a liberal in probably a, a not very liberal town uh, in northern Illinois. And uh, she kind of fell in love with Werner von Braun, 
in the very early uh, space stuff. And so she got all of the Willie Lay and, uh, you know, the other kind of popular from Collier's and Saturday Evening Post mag magazines and, and uh, books that came out at that time, lauding going to the moon and going to Mars. Uh, she loved all that stuff. And when later in life I got to know an astronaut named Rusty Schweikert, uh, I took, and we went to see the movie, uh, The Right Stuff. Uh, my mother and Rusty, this astronaut, went to that movie together. Uh, and that was a, a real connection for her to the dream. Do you think the images of the Navy UFO videos will have cultural resonance, the way the image of a single whole Earth did? Oh, I, I don't track on that at all. But evidently you do. What do you see there? Uh, I see a very serious puzzle that our military and CIA cannot figure out at all. I suppose I think there's a, a modest chance it's an actual alien drone probe. Probably not a very interesting drone probe, just sent out to follow us and then run away. Uh, I've given that 5 or 10% in my estimations, but I find it very puzzling. It forces me to think about our world a lot, that we could have multiple sensory sources of data measuring an object that moves very quickly, and we simply cannot figure out what it is. And it dates back to at least 2004, possibly much longer. So to simply say, oh, it's the China or it's laser-induced plasma, a lot, a lot of explanations just don't quite seem to cut it. Good. Well, it keeps some mystery in your life. I, I, uh, there's things like that that I sort of just shrug and adopt a two-minded approach. Uh, it might be true. Is it something I can do anything about? Is it something that's going to affect me? Uh, if not, I'll just you know stay open to uh, further news. But in the meantime, um, kind of shrug at it. Because one of the things you probably notice as you get older is you've seen a lot of illusions come and go. And uh, I've seen a lot of uh, the world is doomed illusions come and go, you know. Y2K, when we got all the computers are going to stop because they don't know how to handle the year 2000 and stuff like that. Uh, on and on, the peak oil and one thing after another. So I become a, uh, trying to encourage a certain sense of perspective and realism about when people say that the world is going to end because of this, that, or the other thing. Um, humanity's been around for a long time now. The world's been around for a long time now. Uh, biology is incredibly uh, resilient and robust. And I think the world ending trope is just a, a waste of mind. When you put out the whole Earth catalog, how much did you think about the font and style of the early editions? <laughs> well, I was, you know, I stole everything. Um, the typeface, the Windsor typeface I used on the uh, the whole Earth catalog that has sort of become now the typeface of hippiedom, apparently, when I look at some of the nostalgia stuff. Uh, that was the L.L. Bean type font um, that they used. As I admired, I was building on my father's interest in, in uh, mail order catalogs, and L.L. Bean was one of the ones we really liked, and there was a kind of a straightforward New England honesty about it that I really appreciated. And so you would have a leather belt in there for $2.25. And uh, the, the write-up on it, instead of, uh, you know, this will make you more of a man, I just said, it's a pretty good little leather belt, uh, $2.25. And that kind of pragmatic clarity and, and uh, succinctness uh, I took as a model of how to review things in the whole Earth catalog. Do you know what I think of when I see uh, editions of that catalog? I, I wonder, how did you manage to typeset the whole thing? Oh, uh, <clears throat> well, a couple things made possible uh, self-publishing a, a, a book that ambitious. Um, and one of them was the IBM Selectric Composer. It was the golf ball uh, striker where you could take one golf ball that had all of the letters on it uh, in a particular size and font and put on another one, italic or whatever. And so you could do very complex uh, typesetting with basically a, a kind of a jumped up electric uh, typewriter. And so that let us do 
um, really good compositing right there in real time. And likewise, photography, uh, getting half tones. There was a brand new device that would let you make half tones. And then lots of times I just clipped stuff out of magazines and books and just pasted it down and into paste ups. Um, we originally used uh, beeswax uh, to, you know, a big old frying pan, uh, electric frying pan with melted beeswax and you just paste that on the back of something and slap it down on the page. And uh, that was how we laid it out. How is it that the whole Earth catalog ended? It was a bestseller, had a big cultural impact. I reached Steve Jobs. Why did it stop? Um, you could have just sold the rights and sold out, right? I, I fucked up. Um, I, uh, the original one was 64 pages and $5. And the idea was each one would be bigger and cost less and be better. And that went on, and as you can imagine, we were doing this every six months. Um, and that put a pre I didn't know about uh, taking breaks or vacations or things like that, so I was bearing down pretty incessantly on this thing and getting it right and getting it better each time and all of that. And uh, so I, I went down my own kind of asymptotic um, black hole and uh, as one writer said, uh, by the end of the whole Earth catalog, Stuart Brand was a wreck, and I was a wreck. Uh, so rather than just you know retire and hand it over to somebody else, uh, again, kind of with an artist impulse, I wanted to see what happens if you take a full-blown success and just stop it um, and see what happens. My turned out wrong hypothesis was that others would immediately step into that very obvious uh, opportunity in the market and, and fill it perhaps better. And in many different ways that did not happen. Um, but what did happen is as soon as I named the last Whole Earth Catalog, the last Whole Earth Catalog, that turned out to be the best possible marketing device I could ever have come up with. And uh, Calling something the last anything turns out to, if, if it's honest, which it was at the time, um, it gets people. And so that book became bestseller, it became, uh, got the National Book Award, it was a big deal. And in fact, two different Broadway producers got in touch with me saying that they wanted to do a Broadway play titled uh, The Last Whole Earth Catalog. And with you know people playing volleyball between scenes, and uh, Paul Simon was going to write the lyrics and, and songs. Uh, I later asked Paul Simon if that was that really true. He said, "Yeah, well, it went away like things do." So, um, but I was I was on a, a real downward slope. I had a marriage uh, falling apart, my fault, and uh, so I was I was a wreck for a few years. Why aren't the top entrepreneurs of Silicon Valley more interested in the visual arts? You have been your entire life, but it seems they are not. Why is that? I have no idea. Um, hippies in general were not very good on the visual arts except for comics, Robert Crumb and so on. Um, we were terrific on music. I'm not no good on music at all. But I was uh, trained as and then worked as a graphic photographer. I studied graphic design. Uh, I even studied magazine design back at Stanford and then took a bunch of classes afterwards at San Francisco State College and in the San Francisco Art Institute. So um, I think the exception there is, is Steve Jobs, who had uh, basically studied visual design somewhat at Reed College. And, uh, and when he became fascinated by design as design, that really played out with you know, Apple. And I'm glad I got Apple stock because I knew Steve Jobs. <laughs> so what do you think is missing in Silicon Valley because of this lack of interest in the visual arts? Jobs aside. Hmm. Um, well, you and I both know Patrick Collison 
And I, I see Patrick as a, a kind of a, uh, whenever anybody says something kind of disparaging about Silicon Valley and tech bros and so on, I think of Patrick and think, well, that's bull****. Because uh, he's sort of, the, personally, the, the one I know of the current set. Um, you know, I've had some uh, people who said, who got in touch and said admiring things like Mark Andreessen and uh, Jack at Twitter and um, Chris Cox at Facebook. Um, so I, I feel some personal connection there, but uh, what I'm gibbering about here is I have no theory of Silicon Valley at all, Tyler. What's yours? <laughs> <laughs> well, Stripe Press books are beautiful. I would stress that. Uh, but maybe, maybe there's something about the engineering mindset that in some ways runs counter to the aesthetic mindset. Well, that's interesting. They, they may come together with psychedelics, uh, but not in the arts. Hmm, okay, I think I sort of buy that. Um, and, and that would be a program for, I think, engineering, and you see a fair amount of it at MIT, uh, of trying to keep their engineers from being too uh, mentally siloed uh, into just solving problems with numbers. Now, you first took LSD, if I understand correctly, as part of a military experiment. Oh, well, not like the military, to... but I, I, there was probably military money in it. Uh, what led you to take that plunge? Someone said, do this. It, it wasn't a known thing back then. <clears throat> Why did you do it? I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> um, well, you know, I was young and careless. I was jumping out of airplanes and climbing things and doing all the uh, dangerous stuff that uh, you do when you're young and witless. Um, but that one, I think, was an outgrowth of the Bay Area, Mid-Peninsula, T groups that developed uh, the, the kind of confrontational uh, personal interaction in group sessions that developed in the 50s at Stanford and in that area. And that led to a uh, very transformational approach to ideas of human potential and so on. Uh, when Esalen Institute got started, I had already been doing seminars of my own with students from Stanford at Slate's Hot Springs, it later became Esalen, and got to be friends with Mike Murphy when he was, uh, he and, and uh, Richard Price were starting Esalen Institute. And so all of that human potential stuff was looking at uh, religion, looking at meditation, looking at drugs. Uh, we were, you know, reading about uh, Aldous Huxley and, and what he got from peyote, and I was hanging out with peyote Indians a lot, um, increasingly in the 60s. And so friends in the Stanford area said there were, uh, and LSD was just starting to turn up, and then there was, it was still legal um, through the early 60s, and, and uh, there was a so-called therapeutic model, which is now completely revived. Um, it's interesting that it had to go through a long hiatus of uh, that psychedelics can be useful as a uh, as mental uh, and, and significant personal therapy. Um, and and the idea then was, remember before that, when psychoanalysis first came along, uh, all the anthropologists felt they had to get psychoanalyzed. And uh, this was sort of a, a similar thing that okay, there's this new therapy and uh, it's supposed to be used on sick people, but if it works for sick people, let's try it on healthy people, see if it makes them even healthier. And so that was kind of the theory we were going on. Um, as it happened in that set and setting, as they said, of, a, of therapy, I basically flunked out. It was just a not very pleasant, long episode. But later on, I had personal LSD experiences that were uh, transformative, including one that, that got me going on what a difference the photograph of the whole earth would make. As you know, San Francisco is a relatively small city. So why did it, and not Los Angeles, become the center of hippie culture? That's a fair question. Um, Los Angeles never had 49ers. Uh, Los Angeles never burned to the ground. And so San Francisco, you know, the Phoenix city, they still say sometimes, has a, uh, 
waves of boom and bust. Uh, it's not particularly infrastructural. Los Angeles is completely based on oil and, uh, and then water infrastructure. And uh, major shipping even more than the Bay Area. Um, and there's a frivolousness uh, that the Bay Area is good at. Uh, it has two universities of significance with Stanford and, and Cal. And um, uh, I mean, so does LA, but LA does not feel like a, a college intellectual world, whereas San Francisco somewhat does. And so Silicon Valley really is an outgrowth of, of uh, the industrial park at Stanford <laughs> uh, that was invented by one guy. So, and then those things, as you know, take off economically, they feed themselves and then they become their own storm system. Um, there's a lot of people like me from the Midwest who come to places like California. And, and um, one of the things that I sort of saw, because I spent time on the East Coast in prep school and then in, in uh, New Jersey as a military officer and then a lot in New York as an artist. And the sense I got is that people go to New York and LA to be successful. And uh, you know, if you can make it in the Big Apple, you can make it anywhere, that sort of thing. Nobody says that about San Francisco. They never have and I bet they never do. Um, people go to San Francisco to be happy by and large. And, uh, and then that leads to this sort of uh, devil may care of creativity, which is actually good for business startups of certain kinds, especially ones that have a low threshold like anything digital or anything online. And uh, so screwing around is not only possible, but encouraged. And screwing around is the way you discover uh, new useful things in the world, I think. So um, I knew by the time I graduated from Stanford that I wanted to stay in the Bay Area. I went away to be in the Army and then I came right back. What was the creative peak of Jefferson Airplane? I have no idea. <laughs> you didn't know them? Well, no, who I knew was uh, Grateful Dead pretty well. Uh, you know, the trip festival that I organized with the uh, Mary Banksters with Ken Kesey's group. Um, Grateful Dead had just renamed themselves from the Warlocks and they really took over the three day show that we did. Uh, people just wanted to dance their guts out all night long. And uh, the Dead had the way to do that. All the other artistic stuff that I brought in there was sort of interesting, uh, amusing frippery, but the, the Dead really uh, won the day. And so, uh, that's how I got to know them early on and, and then stayed somewhat in touch through the years. What did you learn from David Crosby? Not a thing, uh, you know, I loved his songs. Um, we apparently had this conversation, I guess you've been reading John Markoff's biography. Of course, yes, it's a good book. And what I remember is being shamefully out of it when I talked to David Crosby. Um, people would show up at the whole Earth truck store uh, where we had this kind of retail outlet for whole earth catalog stuff and uh, want to chat with me. And like Philip Morrison, a fantastic book reviewer, Scientific American showed up like that. And um, David Crosby showed up like that. Uh, I guess Hugh Romney must have brought him. So a wavy gravy and um, lost to me. Maybe David remembers the, <laughs> the conversation. What is it about the early days of San Francisco culture that most people still do not know? Uh, which early days? There's a lot of them. Say the, the 1960s, hippie days. Um, I don't think people know the extent to which the mob uh, took over. Uh, the first pornography, there was some really, really creative pornography coming out of basically hippie artists having a good time and turning the camera on. Uh, and then the, you know, the, the whole dope culture, no hope without dope, uh, everybody was um, 
selling or buying uh, marijuana and, and these other drugs from each other. And then uh, one of the guys named Super Spade um, was, uh, his arms and legs cut off and his torso was hung out by uh, Ocean Beach uh, from a tree. His sort of knowledge of, well, those amateur days of uh, drug sales are gone now and the, uh, uh, the big time players are here in town and do not f with us. Uh, so that uh, was the end of that. And everybody who been selling dope and sort of learned a little bit of business from doing it, uh, then went into business, legitimate business, and they were good at it. And so hippies became basically uh, very good commercial startup folks, um, partly because of that sequence of experiences. Is Clint Eastwood's Dirty Harry a good movie? I don't remember. Uh, Clint Eastwood is an incredible movie director, except for this last one. You know, it shows San Francisco and I think 1971, and the city's supposed to be falling apart. Maybe in some ways it is, but what's striking to me is how much cleaner San Francisco was then than now, and also how few new buildings have been put in. It looks almost like the same city, except for parts of downtown. Oh, that's interesting. You saw it again recently? Is that what happened? About a year ago, during pandemic, I gave it another watch. Well, it, you know, it was a good... And I think respectable dialogue that was set in motion between a kind of conservative approach and a uh, probably excessively liberal framing that was going on at the time in the Bay Area. And so, uh, uh, you know, Make My Day is, uh, became a kind of a conservative line. Now, given your long history with San Francisco, do you think you see its current problems differently since you know so much of the past? Hmm. Um, I think I don't see them clearly enough. I think Patrick has a lot, Patrick Collison has a lot more substantial to say on this issue because he's in the thick of it. He's got to figure out where his workers live and where his point of place of business is and so on. I think a, a major shift that occurred is the to me, completely understandable retreat from Silicon Valley, from the Mid Peninsula. I lived there when we were doing the whole Earth catalog. And it's actually a kind of a horrible place to live compared to Marin County, where I am now. Uh, Marin County being north of the Golden Gate and uh, Silicon Valley being south of San Francisco. And uh, so with Salesforce, uh, with Twitter, with these various um, web organiz web based organizations that moved into the city and built their headquarters there and tried to um, house all their workers there and so on. That is a discussed with suburban uh, working and living and a seeking out of, of downtown. Uh, you've seen it in Seattle with Amazon, you know, staying in downtown Seattle and so on. And because I'd been thinking about, writing about, and researching about cities from about 1998 on, um, that all seemed completely sensible to me. Cities are highly uh, centripetal. They, they, they attract talent. They attract uh, all these things. And, and you know, so uh, Jeffrey West's book, Scale, in the studies going on at Santa Fe Institute on how cities accelerate everything um, and are, are the major economic engines of, of any region or any culture they're in. Um, if you're ambitious and talented, you're going to go to a town. And uh, in the Bay Area, town is San Francisco still. Now, in the last two decades, or, or maybe even a bit more, you've become very interested in this idea of the long view. There's the Long Now Foundation trying to take a very long-term perspective on things, this attempt to build a clock that will last for 10,000 years. Uh, but if I look at your own career, a lot of the most influential things you have done have been quite finite. So you ended the whole Earth catalog, the Merry Pranksters with Ken Kesey, right? That ended a long time ago. Uh, the online bulletin boards you were a part of, which were very important for the early years uh, of the internet, uh, those in their earlier form, those are gone. 
So why, why seek durability if your own influence has typically come through the supposedly transient? Well, some of it's just getting older, <laughs> um, and and uh, and I developed when I was studying buildings, and then later writing about civilization and this kind of pace layered understanding that that part of what makes a dynamically um, self-stabilizing and learning system is that some parts of uh, anything complex and dynamic move very fast and some parts move very slow. And we tend to pay attention to the fast parts like fashion and commerce and uh, not pay attention to the really powerful parts like uh, nature and culture. And um, once I sort of had that perspective, and plus I'd been a professional futurist for 20 years with the Global Business Network, where I saw that <clears throat> people doing scenarios would uh, treat 25 years as a very long time frame. Uh, the military we did scenarios for would sometimes go out 50 years. And uh, I thought, you know, that's considering the level of stuff going on, changes going on, it's understandable people would pay attention to the short term. But meanwhile, these basic dynamics of the really slow stuff is where the power is, um, calls for a reorientation of focus. And um, so when Danny Hillis, computer scientist at MIT, who I'd gotten to know at the Media Lab, uh, wrote an email saying, I'd like to build a a clock the scale of Stonehenge that keeps a very long-term time and ticks once a century and bongs every thousand years. Um, he sent that out to everybody he knew, but nobody responded but me. And I responded and said, let's do it. Uh, I think because of the, the stuff I just mentioned, there's a, a realizing, I mean, Danny's framing of it was, this was all through the 80s and 90s. Everybody referred to the future as the year 2000. And Danny was growing up during that time. And he said, so for my entire life, the future has been getting shorter by one year per, per year. That does not seem like a, a healthy frame of mind for a, a, health, a civilization that wants to be healthy to have. And what could pop through that membrane of the year 2000? Uh, and so coming up with the idea of a very durable, uh, basically, um, perpetual motion machine of a clock. Uh, the clock, by the way, it is not trying to be built. It is built. It's almost completed in Texas on Jeff Bezos's mountain range. Um, the, uh, it's not a, a perpetual motion machine in the sense that it takes the temperature difference on the very high mountain it's on uh, between night and day and runs an air bladder that then provides energy that keeps the clock knowing what time it is for thousands of years. Would the younger Stuart Brandt, say in his 20s, be disappointed in the future that has come to pass? Oh, um, mixed bag. Uh, a whole lot of stuff uh, developed uh, fantastically, I think. Um, as a biologist, I love seeing biotechnology uh, finally relink with with field biology, um, conservation biology. I'm involved in that, doing uh, co-founding Revive and Restore to uh, use biotech for the help of conservation wildlife projects. Um, so that's played out pretty well. By and large, uh, when I was optimistic about stuff, I turned out to be right. And when I was pessimistic about stuff, I turned out to be wrong often enough that it has kept optimism alive. Um, and right now the political conundrum of the United States has me worried and I don't know what to do about it. And I can see that cyber war is gonna play out in some ugly ways um, and already is to a large extent. And I don't see um, automatic solutions to either of those or ones that I can help with, except that um, focusing on long-term frame, the long now, we describe it as the last 10,000 years and the next 10,000 years. So there's, you know, there's the now that is 
an hour long, the hour now that is two weeks long, the year in the middle of, and then there's the uh, somewhat longer now that is 20,000 years long. And I think human civilization has earned and needs uh, the perspective of that as a foundation for thinking about everything. Do you look much to science fiction for ideas and inspiration, or not? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the new Steel Nielsen, uh, Neil Stevenson um, termination uh, shock is brilliant in terms of um, really playing out the geoengineering schemes that are out there. Uh, Neil did fantastic research on it. Uh, better than most people I know, including many professionals. Um, and likewise, Kim Stanley Robinson, uh, with the Ministry for the Future, um, again, beautiful research on, on what overheating uh, wet bulb high temperatures can mean for, for human survival in places like India. Uh, and then playing that out in, in kind of politically astute terms, uh, this is some of the best thinking going on in society. And uh, science fiction has always opened that door to thinking about the future in creative ways. Um, Marvin Minsky, who I knew at MIT, uh, was always quoting Isaac Asimov. And, uh, and he just said, look, these are artists who thought about this stuff a lot, and I paid close attention. Uh, I feel the same. How did your year working with California Governor Jerry Brown make you less libertarian? Hasn't California governance turned out to be a big mess? No, I think California governance was and, and still is uh, pretty damn good. Uh, what I learned is that the libertarians I knew, and, and they sort of clustered around the whole Earth catalog because in a sense, the whole Earth catalog was saying, you know, uh, this is right after Jack Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you. Um, you know, ask what you can do for your country. Uh, we sort of said, ask not what your country can do for you. Do it your damn self. And so there was a do-it-yourself thing that translated for many as a uh, screw the government. And then the whole hippie period was uh, counterculture, and a lot of that was uh, played out politically in the new left and so on. So, um, working for your, in, in the governor's office in Sacramento and wearing a three-piece suit, um, I, one of the things we started was, uh, that I started, was a, a, a water atlas of California. Um, and, and then the research that, was, that we set in motion uh, from the governor's office to bring about this actually quite beautiful and somewhat influential book. Um, California is a hydraulic civilization, as you know. We, we move our water around, and that's what makes uh, agriculture the main event here. It's what makes Los Angeles possible, and so on and so forth. Um, I saw the people at the Water Resources uh, Department uh, I saw what they did all day, and uh, we would show up saying, "Look, we need uh, we need some data on the Smith River, uh, which is the only undammed Smith, only undammed river in California, and uh, you know what's the patterns of flow in that, and uh, how how deep your records go." And uh, somebody's uh, deputy assistant would say, "We thought you'd never ask." And they had been, you know, carefully keeping this data and trying to correlate it with things and keep it up to date in the various computer systems and so on for decades. And the low paid, high quality, selfless work that these folks were doing. Um, and in the governor's office, you always knew who was Republican, who was a Democrat and why and all this kind of stuff. Down in the departments, nobody knew and nobody cared. Uh, there were Republicans and Democrats scattered throughout the whole system, and it was uh, part of the ethic of that 
part of government to just not be um, political in, in the uh, divisive sense at all. And, and so I was seeing something that the libertarian folks I knew knew nothing about and were not the slightest bit interested in. They weren't actually interested. I think you're, as somewhat of a libertarian, are interested in how government works. Most of the ones I knew were not. And they were interested in how election works and they thought the absurdities that they saw in elections and electioneering was government and it's not. Um, and so I finally got the perspective of, of what, of, you know, what is now vilified as the deep state. And the deep state, at least in California, is damned impressive. And so I came out being uh, way less interested uh, in who was the governor. I basically came out saying, well, Jerry's a good governor as near as I can tell, but then later Arnold Schwarzenegger was a pretty good governor. Um, Reagan had been a pretty good governor. And the realization I had is Donald Duck could be governor and it wouldn't be the end of the state. Um, you know, Trump finally proved that you could have uh, somebody as a president in that case who could be really destructive. And, and uh, the deep state was not as successful as it usually is of working around it. But that's you know, reflective of a whole bunch of other stuff going on that I do not um, comprehend, frankly. Now, you've written a good deal about architecture. Do you view the forthcoming smart home as a blessing or a curse? Oh, it's always been a curse. The, um, I mean, the Internet of Things is making stuff a lot more convenient, a lot more uh, handy, and um, but people have been banging away on, on making homes smart for decades and decades. Um, I, I think that one of the things we'll be figuring out increasingly for the next few decades is um, what things to hand over to robots and what things not to. And there'll be lots of stuff that surprises us. That it, it's just great that robots are doing that. Um, frankly, I, I love the... Uh, autopilot on a Tesla I drive. Um, I don't use it to get all the way from here to there. I use it so I don't have to pay close attention to traffic, just peripheral attention. And the difference there is fantastic. But trying to get a whole bunch of things uh, coordinated around shortcut convenience, uh, that is kind of a long cut to finally to you know, program it all so it works. I, it kind of winds up like those... Uh, uh, remote clickers for television have too many buttons and people finally learn the three buttons to do what they mainly want and, and pay no attention to the rest. Um, and then, you know, the, the younger members of the family sort them all out and uh, become adept at it. And then uh, the next generation of, of uh, excessive choices comes along and, and they don't know and they've got to ask their kids how the hell does this complex thing work. So I think there's... Uh, a kind of an endless quest for uh, complete handiness. And I think generally uh, people who go for simplicity rather than uh, robotized complexity in terms of personal living uh, are happier. And if we, in proper Hayekian fashion, want more of an organically evolving architecture, what can we do to get there? Well, I wrote a whole book called How Buildings Learn. Um, it's probably my best book, and it's certainly most successful. Um, it's now treated as a classic and taught in classes and so on. And it's basically that um, a building is not something you finish. A building is something you start. And a building is an ongoing process that is in um, perpetual dialogue with the user, the users of the building and the uses of the building. And it's standing in the real estate market and so on. And um, professional high concept architecture is sort of uh, allergic to all of that. And they want to make a work of art or signature piece of something or other with the, you know, the look of that particular um, architect. And, and um, they hope that the function will work out. 
So uh, the, the buildings that tend to go best are ones that are really durable, like uh, the old brick factories of the East Coast or some of the tilt-up concrete spaces, um, what I call low-road buildings. Um, for example, at Stanford when I was there, uh, there were temporary buildings left over from World War II, and at MIT, the, the Rad Lab, the Building 20, uh, was where most of the real, well, much of the real innovation that happened in curriculum, in science, uh, in engineering happened in, uh, in the trailers. It happened in, the, in Building 20. And because those were buildings that nobody cared about, you could do anything you wanted in there. You could adapt the building to whatever kind of research you were doing. Uh, and it was cheap. And um, you could throw things together and have them fall apart and not care, or have them take over uh, the world. And uh, because you'd started cheap, you were you know, able to get there without having to overinvest. And so um, buildings that, that adapt well over time are uh, basically built strong for certain reasons and then uh, stay strong uh, as the decades go by and the different uses go by. In the book, I wound up sorting out various things that have those qualities and things that don't. Uh, I had a chapter on maintenance because everything uh, buildings are sort of the most maintenance needing and maintenance defying uh, things that we build. Um, and so there's a constant dialogue between uh, keeping up with that and letting it go and then cycles of uh, real estate value that go in and out and so on and so forth. Um, I don't have a short answer to your question of what makes them uh, more adaptable. But uh, l really looking at what buildings do over time sure helps. Why does Japan fascinate you so much? Uh, they're the most advanced material culture in the world, I think. Uh, you know, how to wrap five eggs and things like that are, are a matter of uh, enormous interest in craft. And uh, I'm paying attention to them now because um, my friend Kevin Kelly, who's traveled all over Asia and including all over Japan. He said he's looked and looked for a broken roof tile in Japan and he can't find it. Um, and there's an attention to detail of um, caring about the, the physical essence of stuff that um, the Japanese are, are surpassing it. On the other hand, you know, there's a lot of so screwed up in Japanese culture. The, the cities are a mess. The buildings, most of them are kind of haphazardly built. Uh, I first fell in love with Japanese architecture through a book written by a Japanese home and its surroundings, 1896, by uh, a New Englander. And he just spelled out the traditional Japanese home and the, the genkan and the, the use of the tatami mats and relationship with the garden and the benjo and all this stuff, the bathroom. And um, the, the aesthetic practicality of it just knocked me out. And I actually got to stay in a house like that in, in Kyoto uh, for, uh, for a season, uh, one year, and it was fantastic. So uh, Japanese craft at its best is just the best there is. In what year will we bring back the woolly mammoth? What's your point estimate? Certainly in this century, I think we'll have uh, what looks like and acts like woolly mammoths back. Uh, I would like to see them back in uh, large herds in the, in the uh, Siberian and in the Northern Canadian steppes uh, doing their old job of, of eating the grass and therefore causing the grass uh, grazers make grass. And so the, the so-called mammoth steppe, which was once the world's largest biome reaching all the way across the, around the, the North Pole and the Arctic and subarctic, um, climatologically is much more stable. But mainly it was, it was the Serengeti of the North. This was where, um, you know, there were endless large animals and incredibly rich 
uh, animal and vegetable ecosystem compared to what's there now. Uh, that's a case where humans, to some extent, climbed it, but mainly humans got rid of all the megafauna by killing them and eating them, and uh, that keeps happening. Uh, and as they come back, they will, uh, the way the elephants and rhinos and whatnot do in, in Africa, they will bring back the mosaic landscape that is drastically richer and, by the way, much more stable in terms of climate. And what's stopping us from doing this within the next, say, 20 years? Um, it might happen in the next 20 years. Uh, the outfit called Colossal has decided to put in uh, serious commercial money <coughs> Uh, with George Church at Harvard and others that are working on, uh, on, on bringing uh, genes from the extinct mammals so we know what they are now because of paleogenetics and uh, putting them into uh, Asian elephant genomes and start bringing back the, uh, the Arctic capability of, of you know, the blood system and the the thick hair and the rest of it that, that, that makes it possible for an elephant to uh, not only survive but thrive in the far north. Uh, as it happens, Asian elephants already live in Canada and like to break through the ice in the pond or go swimming. Uh, they wouldn't make it through the long Arctic night, but they already like the cold. When you're big and massive, uh, cold is not, not that uh, harsh an event. So um, I think bringing Grazers and megafauna back to the far north will be um, practical and beneficial. It's already going on at, at this place called Pleistocene Park in uh, far northeastern Siberia. To close, I have just a few questions about the Stewart brand production mm -hmm. function. Are you ready? Sure. Now, you're well into your 80s, correct? Correct. I'm 83. So what is it you do to stay so sharp? Um... Uh, pick parents with genes that uh, make that possible. That's the main thing. And what do you do after that? And after that, I, I, frankly, I don't understand people who go quiescent intellectually as they get older. Um, it, you know, as you get, in a way, getting older, uh, you get more control of your time and you have more savvy on how to do things and how to make things happen and who to call when you have a question and all that stuff. Uh, and so your ability to investigate stuff, and especially with the internet now, is going up all the time. And uh, you know why would why would you let curiosity uh, fade? Um, and, and and many don't. You've probably noticed that uh, people you know in their seventies are different from people that, that you knew in their seventies when you were a little kid. And they kind of, you know, uh, it was over. They were settling down to play golf or whatever it was. And uh, probably a whole lot of people you know in their 70s and 80s are hard at it. Uh, in some cases, just hitting their stride. And that's a change that has occurred in my lifetime. Um, that is a total treat. And as near as I can tell, uh, that one is permanent. I think that's with us now. People will live longer and... Uh, and thrive longer. The health span is now being referred to instead of lifespan. And health span meaning uh, how long you can be uh, really engaged and productive and alive to things. Um, so, and I think that's very good in terms of long term thinking uh, because people who are older are, are have a longer now. Their future may be getting shorter, but their past is. Uh, personal and significantly long. They've seen a lot of stuff come and go, and they've seen a lot of um, skills that possibly they had time to pick up that they can now deploy. And all of that is uh, makes at least the kind of intellectual life that we both seem to enjoy uh, that much richer. And so long as you're the genes are supporting your brain cells and whatever other medications and stuff we can do. I mean, uh, medically, I'm, it's possible for me to carry on in ways that would not have been possible a century ago. So um, there you have it. We are 
we are living longer and we're finding ways to keep the human body and human brain functioning better longer. So um, why would you not take advantage of that? How has giving away money kept you creative? Um, I'm not that good at it. Um, uh, there, there, I've now gotten to know a number of philanthropists who are really good at it, and I know that I'm not. Um, and at one point, uh, I, uh, there was a guy who was getting into philanthropy because he, he started eBay, and uh, and I said, uh, you know, if you like, I can try to find some good things that I know about that maybe you don't that would be good to put your money into. And he said, sure, fine, here's uh, you know, X amount of money. Go ahead and make good things happen. And I worked on it for about six months and just failed utterly. Um, I was not good at that. So I would love to see a whole lot more really creative philanthropy. Uh, this is another thing that I think you and Patrick Collison, uh, like you've done with your FAST grants, uh, can help move um, much more creative philanthropy. One of the things I've noticed all my life is that philanthropy should be the most creative thing going. It's got to be more creative than government. It's got to be more creative than anything that, that uh, commercial entities can do. And um, that it is not is just a, a waste because especially in America we're the most philanthropic society uh, in the world and yet it's not as creative as it should be. Last question. How do you decide what to pay attention to? Well it's a little different than Kevin Kelly's. When you get Kevin Kelly on he'll tell you it's um, what he sees that nobody else is doing that only he can do. And then he'll pay attention to that and try to make something useful happen. I'm, uh, I don't care as much about whether other people are doing something. Uh, what I'm looking for is things that will, in Gregory Bateson's terms, make circuit with the world. Um, and, and you see some of this in, in software development where people talk about the minimum viable product. And you start to get a, a user base that you can co-evolve with and develop your product so it's actually being useful to them. And Amazon talks about the minimum lovable product where it's not only uh, useful, it's compelling. And, uh, and that you don't let anything into the world unless it has its lovability uh, quality to it. I'm a little earlier in the process of I'm just feeling around for things that that feel like they're overlooked. Uh, with the whole Earth catalog, do it yourself was something that uh, elder, you know, middle-aged gentlemen who'd retired is what they were doing in their garage, um, and was kind of looked down on. Catalogs were kind of looked down on, and uh, basically I just took those two things that were uh, regarded with disdain and, and turned them into. Uh, something that, was, that turned out to be powerful. Likewise, right now I'm focusing on maintenance, um, partly because I noticed in myself and in everybody else a reluctance to think about maintenance because it's a chore, it's a nuisance, it's a problem. There is no kind of economic uh, short-term value in it, um, and, 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 and. And uh, because with the Long Now Foundation, we're uh, looking at becoming a long-term institution to sort of stay with the clock. Um, that's based on noticing the difference between Stonehenge, the Egyptian pyramids, and the Ise Shrine in Japan, where um, nobody knows the hell the pyramid, what the Stonehenge was really for. Um, and we know a lot about Pharaonic religion with the pyramids, but it's dead as a doornail. And yet, Ise Shrine, uh, expressing Shinto culture in Japan, is as alive today as it was uh, 1,500 years ago, and it is the beating heart of Japanese culture. So what's the difference? And uh, the difference is, uh, I guess, maintenance, and it's uh, institutionalizing. Um, we've got a lot more respect for institutions and trying to understand their institutions 
And Alexander Rose, the director of the Long Now Foundation, is uh, actively funding and pursuing the study of longevity in institutions, what actually makes it work, what makes them earn their longevity and keep it uh, in a changing world. Uh, well, the whole concept of maintenance, I think, in the th is in the thick of all of that. And so um, I'm spending all my time now in this room with all these books, um, sorting out how to think about maintenance in general. Stuart Brand, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. That was fun.